Well, welcome to the UC Buyer. And today we're with Micah Singer. Micah has been in this whole world of VIP since the very beginning. I mean, Micah, you started in about what, 2002, 2003? Concept here is that you were a pioneer. You were trying to break ground with the rest of us in that 2003, four, five, which was so difficult because it didn't work all the time. So congratulations for having carried that through to a successful exit and then going on and working a little for Broadsoft and then going on beyond that to what you're doing now, which is to create an integration with Microsoft Teams. So that's what we want to talk about is that little piece of integration that you think changes the way a business works. You know, after the sale and, and, and you know, more recent, you, know, you sort of come back into the market and it's changed quite a bit. And, and you know, we've tremendous changes, of course. And you know, what the big change that caught my eye was team collaboration, Slack, for starters, of course, and then uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, you, you know, that came on some years after Slack and, and has really, as we all know, gained momentum here in the last, really about the last year, but in the last six months, pronounced. It, it's a game changer at the highest level. These are platforms that lots of people use to work better, more productively. They're, you know, these are all, I don't know if you call them version 1.0 or 2.0, but they're versions that will be improved upon. And so I was trying to think, you know, what, what does the improvement look like? And where does the telephone and the telephone system and telecom technology fit into this equation? And, and that really, uh, I, I think I found how that works for now and, and I'm, I'll talk to you about it, but that, that's what got me to start Teammate Technology about a year, a little over a year ago and, and got us right on the cusp of a launch here at the end of July. So what types of things is, is Teammate doing to differentiate itself in the market? What type of clients are you serving? You know, this is one of those old dog new trip tricks moment. Um, you know, when, when I started VoIP Logic in 2003, technology was really cool in advance, but you know, the, the tools weren't near where they are now. So, so I've been learning a lot. So, you know, one of, the, one of the big changes is we don't own any servers. Everything's in Azure cloud, everything, any, you know, call routing, web apps, all virtual machines, really easy, uh, all containerized, easy to duplicate in different geographies. I mean, so easy. That and a lot of the tools for managing uh, our team internally. I mean, the at VoIP Logic, we, we didn't have an office. We were one of these 30 person remote working teams. And uh, I love that model. You know, you find the best people where they are. But now the tools, I mean, GitHub and Jira and uh, all the, the dashboards for managing development and product, knowledge base. I mean, we use Confluence and Jira. So just everything's out there for you to cobble together into your, you know, the, the tools to make a product like we're making are very available. That's been fun to relearn a little bit older in my, you know, different place in my life. Well, that is huge, especially when you consider that the, you know, literally you'll get all the stats, the remaining frontier, I guess, if you will, on the user adoption is the enterprise. But uh, if you look at companies over a thousand employees, I think the adoption rate of UC is still sub, sub 20% last, last stats I saw. And, and a lot of those companies, I mean, you know, I would say 50% at least of those companies are already Microsoft Office users or Microsoft 365 users. Right. Yeah. Exactly. No, it's, it's, uh, so, so that overlap, I mean, I saw, you know, the Venn diagram of PBX users globally and Microsoft users globally overlaps a lot. And in that overlap are large enterprises and large enterprises, you know, their convenience is really important and usability, I mean, they don't wanna, you know, they don't wanna have, you know, hundreds or thousands of workers and they just wanna make it easy. And, um, and Microsoft Teams has solved that with that, you know, direct routing and calling, but, and the, and the mobile app, I mean, just the mobile app's been great. Um, they really seem to have put a good product in the market for calling, you know, nothing's perfect and they are improving it, but, uh, but I've been impressed. And really yeah. you and I were talking about what is the future of the PBX? I mean, people don't want to have a phone on their desk necessarily. So they're building it into the applications that they use all day. And you said, hey, it's kind of cool when we rethink how the phone works. We've all seen the numbers decline on, on voice calls in general and business voice calls. And, you know, and even quicker when you take out mobile calls um, and you, you talk about the business phone. And, you know, it's still a, it's still a really important tool. I think what's changed is 20 years ago was a more important tool in businesses and now it's less important. 
but no one, I don't think most companies are about to throw away phone calling. I mean, they might say just use your mobile or right. something, but, but sort of Teams answers a question there because it's mobile. It, it's an application that you know, works great on your mobile, great on your desktop. People have Teams phones too for old school. It sort of provides an answer to how do you, how do you put business telephony and control it in all these places. And then the, the second part of the question, Dave, is, is PBX. Is a PBX, what's the value of the PBX? I mean, right. call control is used by a lot of people. I mean, I think a lot of, there's call centers and contact centers who are, we sort of, you know, we say are separate, but that's just advanced PBX often, you know, it's call control. I have seen, you know, there's a big debate about how, you know, at what point the company say Teams is good enough or some other PBX light is good enough and we don't need the, all the call control we had. Um, that's happening every day slowly. I think it's going to be a really long and slow process. I've been hearing about the death of the desk phone for, gosh, probably since uh, mid 2000s, right? Death of the PSTN landlines. They're, they're, still, they're still out there, but because of this, you know, the pandemic, voice calling in aggregates actually increasing. Interesting. Makes sense. They're not next yeah. to each other anymore. Yeah. No, exactly. So the CIO getting their users to actually adopt it, use it was a huge challenge. And I think what's happened since then is the ability to seamlessly integrate the headset with, uh, you know, teams or other collaboration platform. What other things does your connector do that changes the way a worker works? I think it's where people use the phone system. It, it, you know, the, Mike was saying how, you know, lots of people still have phones on their desk and soft phones haven't, you know, to now haven't been compelling enough for people. You know, we, we've all used different soft phones over the years and, and, you know, we use them, we like them, we stop using them. It's not portable. Microsoft's built something that is portable. I mean, I, I, I you, you speak from anecdotes often cause we're, we're humans, but I, you know, I, I work, I'm on, I'm on a client here. I'm on my mobile when I'm moving, I'm on my tablet at home. It's a totally same experience. I mean, for dialing, I have the same dial pad. I have the same phone number. It's annoyingly effective at reaching me. <laughs> that, that's, right. that's my biggest complaint. Whereas, you know, soft phones are usually tied to one computer or they're not portable enough. So, so they've, they've, it, it you know, again, to a point of overkill, they've, they know how to find you, Microsoft Teams, and uh, and and that's that's good if you're running a business and and you know your employees uh, lets them work lets them work from home. It lets them you know once people are walking through airports, it lets them walk through airports again, and 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 salespeople stay in touch. And so I think there's been uh, it there's been it it's sort of a visceral reaction. It's hard to tap, and we always look at numbers. You know, 75 million daily active users on Teams is a big number, but the visceral reaction of the users, like, do they like it? You know, are they using it more? Is it making their life better? You know, you know, do they say to their husband or wife, this Teams is awesome. This is really, you know, and, and I, I do all those things. <laughs> I, uh, I, and, and, and so I think that's what I'm really excited about. Um, I, I thought, I thought I didn't see I didn't know Microsoft would do ju just as good of a job on what they've, what they've put out. That's what's been impressive. I mean, I think it takes a big company to, to do what they've done. I mean, it's hard for a startup to, to, I mean, Slack should be very, you know, Slack is super impressive what they created from scratch. Microsoft sort of followed their model in a lot of ways and has done a great job. You know, you think about what has Microsoft done in the telephony world? And so maybe we should start there and say, this is how they came into being a telephone service provider. Isn't that weird? It feels like Microsoft from the beginning was excited about communication from LCS, OCS, you know, back in the day, I think Link even before that, but they really never wanted to be a PBX company. Right. And, uh, you know, the, their first PBX product was released, I believe it was Skype for Business Cloud PBX in late 2015. And, it, they're adequate features, but I think they've been waiting to sort of for, for call control and the thing, you know, the, the PBX user base to stop needing a PBX as much and to migrate to what they were doing. And uh, it hasn't happened quite like that, but communication, there's been a groundswell of different kinds of communication that are, you know, chat, persistent chat and, 
and video, you know, video and, 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 and voice calls sort of client to client like we're doing. And others have started to see growth in that. And Microsoft jumped in board, on board with, with Skype for Business first, which had a lot of users using internal chat and internal calling. And now with Teams, they've, they've amplified that, but they've also, they've allowed us to, they've allowed our world to participate and they've opened up the door with a SIP channel that works, that lets you connect Microsoft Teams world to PBX, PSTN world. And, and that's actually a big deal um, in, our, in our market. So what, what, how would you describe your, your target? You said you sell through... Yeah. Um, providers, I presume, VARs, Microsoft distributors. So what's the profile look like for uh, companies that you're gonna, your, your team's going to work with? And uh, what types of things should they be considering right now? I have some ideas about how this might grow, but right now the response, the, the real interest is from anyone who's in the PBX ecosystem because they, you know, they have customers that use the PBX for a reason. They, whether it's on-prem or cloud, it doesn't make a difference. Those same customers are using Microsoft Teams. And I don't know if it's a defensive posture that they want to have this integration, but it's a logical one. It makes them sort of, uh, you know, it, it, it marries them a little to Microsoft if they're not already an MSP or reselling Microsoft, which a lot of them are. So it's a, it's a step towards being an MSP or an IT services company. And it's something their customers are, are clamoring for and asking about. So it's a way to sell a premium seat. So what we're seeing is lots of cloud PBX uh, companies like, um, uh, you know, like people who sell through resellers, people who sell direct, people who you have Broadworks or NetSapiens or MetaSwitch, um, or then there's the on-prem guys like Mitel and NEC and Avaya where the on-prem equipment is fine, it's SIP, you can register a soft phone, it's, that's, you can just do that. So, so distributors of those systems see this as a great value add to, uh, you know, to make a, an old system worth more, make that, uh, the Mitel on-prem work more. So all of these folks in the PBX ecosystem are, have, have been the ones calling and those are what we call resellers. I mean, they, they have, we give them a portal and they sign up their customers and they run their business and, we're a small part of it. I think in our past lives, you and I were, you know, had a similar, distrib very similar distribution strategy. Ours was more really pointed at independent phone companies and that's right. Uh, large MSPs trying to transform. And I've been saying for gosh, five, six years to everybody that'll listen that if you're a, if you're a PBX vendor distributor and you haven't begun the path to move to the cloud and by the way, owning the client, not, not selling as an agent, you, you got to be thinking about that now because the, the market is moving. It's moving faster than anybody thinks it does. And, and it uh, sounds like you are bringing in a solution that makes it easy for them to do that. It's part of it. I mean, we're, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't have, I, I'm not too grandiose about it. I mean, we make a, a strange shaped screw that's really important to a certain connection and, and a, an important connection to, to a lot of things. But, uh, but I mean, these guys need, you know, they need a, they need to think about their strategy for UC and C, you know, they need to understand how they behave in a world where there's these big platforms they're navigating. So, I mean, they, they have a lot of challenges, PBX companies, and, uh, and hopefully we, you know, we're part of some of the solutions. So how much of adoption is driven off of just, it's the experience is easier. The trick and what, what the problem we're solving is, so Teams, you know, I mentioned Microsoft has built a way to connect the SIP trunk outside of Teams. But PBXs are used primarily by hosted PBX users, by registered SIP users. So the, the idea is whatever the experience you have today as a phone user on your desk phone, if you have a soft phone, whatever it is, our job was to replicate it inside of Teams. So what that means is that team's user, just like a soft phone user, is registered to that PBX that they were using before. That's, that's the threat, that's the, uh, that was the challenge we've overcome. So t SIP trunking, no problem. You can do that in two minutes, registered user. So everything is the same. So, you know, things will change, but, it, you know, I don't think now is a particular moment for a discrete step. I mean, you were a PBX user yesterday, you wanna be a PBX user today or tomorrow, and you want to have a, an easy to understand 
portable experience and teams let you do it. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's what we're facilitating and yeah, it's crazy the demand for, for this easy and understandable experience. They're hitting this market right as COVID-19 pandemic was spreading worldwide and opening that up to service providers to now deliver teams and dialing that. I'm curious what the story was in terms of how you founded the company, why, you know, uh, Microsoft and what specifically for somebody that's not using yep. Teams today, what are the things that, that it does that you think are uh, game changing? I think you're right. You know, that Microsoft has sort of been, I'm going to, uh, you know, moving along at a much lower user base than they could have, uh, they, they have achieved now and, and what changed and what got me excited was in June of 2018, they announced direct routing. And so direct, you know, I, I mentioned in the last answer, direct routing is the, the SIP trunk. And prior to that, Microsoft had been taking more or less a go it alone approach. Like you buy Microsoft for your communications and your PBX and everything. And it doesn't work that well, by the way, or you don't. And, uh, and so with direct routing, what they said is, Hey, we're building a platform here. It's teams. You do lots of stuff in here. You know, you, you can, you can integrate apps. You can, um, look at your files, documents, meetings, uh, all these things. And, and also now calling is built in. It's really easy to activate. So they said, well, you can connect your, you can connect the SIP trunk in, I mean, I can do it in two minutes, literally from nothing with our technology and, and others have built that integration. And then there's the PBX. And so the P, registering and, and integrating a PBX or letting those PBX users use, you know, use Teams as a soft phone in addition. So when they built direct routing, the native Microsoft ones is called uh, calls. So when you click on calls and if you have direct routing built, you get a dial pad, you get call history, you get, you know, you get sort of a rudimentary soft phone built in there. So that was a big change. There used to be, I think, a lot of cross launches, you know, where you you know you click a button and it takes you to another application, or and and that doesn't work very well for mobile. It doesn't work very well anywhere. So they made it usable. They made calling usable natively in Teams, and they opened it up so every PBX manufacturer, every SIP trunk provider in the world could sell to that user base. What fires up most of the developer community around? Microsoft Teams is the openness of the platform. So integrations only work because there's APIs and there's openness. And so Microsoft last year in beta was something called the Microsoft Graph API. And, and that's sort of a one, it's a Graph API. It's one URL that lets you access all the information in Office. So emails and phone stuff and files and you know, contacts and calendar and, but they're slowly exposing some of the new the APIs. So, you know, presence management is not exposed yet. That's a big deal. Some of the other phone features aren't exposed and some are. So, so what I see is a much more integrated experience within teams that's possible. You know, I, I get crazy requests. I had a dentist office uh, yesterday in California. He said, we want our SMSs and we want our transcriptions of our, you know, we want our phone calls. And, and I was like, that sounds great. <laughs> you know, and that's a ton of work and it's a ton of custom work. And we're not, we're not doing that today. But those things that are really cool customizations can be done a lot easier with open APIs and a common platform. So I think that Dennis, you know, he's going to be able to put that together himself in five years. A lot of times innovation comes out of these challenging times and it's going to be fascinating. I think to watch what type of innovations come around enabling companies to adapt to this new reality. If you're a service provider, you can build a PBX offering on Twilio. And if you're a company, you can build, you know, if you're, if you're into that kind of thing, you can do it today with the pieces. It takes a while for that dentist in Sacramento to, to be able to use it and to see it as an option. And, and, and it's like, he wants to be a dentist. He doesn't want to be a phone technician. You know, something like two-factor authentication, which was sort of cool three years ago, is just like painfully annoying now because I get so many of them because yeah. everyone's figured it out and it's a product and it's, it's, you know, it's one of many products that we'll see coming out and getting wide adoption. We, we've all been in this UC space now for, for a number of years. And, you know, one of the things that's fascinating to me is over the last few months is watching the, the market be forced to adopt collaboration tools. So yeah, what kind of 
What are you hearing from Microsoft relative to user rates over the last few months? Any kind of uh, conclusions you can draw from that in terms of what that means for technology providers like yourself for the next couple of years? What's been interesting with Microsoft in particular is, you know, I think a lot of people have installed Microsoft technology like Skype for Business and now Teams but they weren't using it. <laughs> so a lot, right. a lot of, a lot of the users had it on, you know, had their company said download it and they did, and it wasn't being used because they were working together. Um, everyone going remote has really led people to, you know, actually find that application and start using it. And people who are already using it, I mean, some of these new users, but people who are already using it are finding new ways to use it. So, you know, I, the number I think about a lot are our power users. You know, there's platforms and there's lots of platforms out there, but when companies become power users and you and their, their employees become power users of that platform, it sticks. So, so for instance, if you want to put calling into teams, if you want to use what we're doing, you, you know, if you're already doing file sharing and chat and meetings, it's a lot you know, more interesting. You're going to pay for it. It's super convenient. It's great. But if you're not, if you're just doing chat, you might not. And I think that was the equation with Skype for business and teams. And this particular situation we're in has led more people to take up remote tools, use them and say, these are great. <laughs> yeah. It's right. Sort of forced adoption. If you're one of those companies out there that got cut flat footed, let's say February, March time frame, whenever you have a pivot remote, right. And you happen to have, you know, a prem-based system in place. You haven't enabled the full stack collaboration for your employees, and now you're scrambling to get freemium tools in place. Now that I wouldn't say we're settling back to the normal, but we at least know we're going to be in this this period of uncertainty for a period of time. What types of things should we be considering? If you're a Microsoft, if you're an enterprise that uses Microsoft, you are you already have it in front of you. It's about activating it. It's included free, you know, for the basics. And then, you know, the second part of where you want to take it as a company is, I, I mean, I, I can name the top six things, but, but really any company has the things they do together, whether it's, you know, video calls or chat or they share, they work on documents together a lot, or they're in meetings all day, like all of us probably. So they're scheduling, it's a calendar and the rest of it. And, 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 the, and then you need a platform that meets those needs. And you know, there, there are actually a bunch out there, you know, lots of companies have, started and built really cool technology, but everyone's using Microsoft and Slack primarily. And, and uh, you know, Google has their new Gmail announcement, I think this week or, or late last week, you know, they're, they're sort of, they'll have an entrant too, but, but you want to go with a reliable brand. You want to go with a place where all the different tasks that you do normally are in there. I mean, lots of companies do have specialized applications they use and they aren't integrated. So then teams might not be good a lot of the, uh, the tools for these pla like Slack and teams, especially have, are building tools for easy integration. I think Slack has over 2000 built integrations now and teams has about 700 and, and gaining fast. We're, we're one of those as uh, what we've done. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you know, I, I think it's trusted brand. It's a something that fits what you're doing as a company, uh, the tasks you, you guys perform and then ease of deployment and use the worker starts to use these integrations in such a way that they become dependent upon them. Like for instance, something as simple as click the call, you start to get addicted to that little thing. Instead of having to dial a number, you just click on their information, their contact, and bang, that call goes out. So the other thing that I love is voicemail to email. I mean, simple little things like that that integrate the way that I do business all day and make me more effective because of these little helpers. I think that what you've created is this seamless way to change the place that the phone lives. You know, yeah. it, it used to be disconnected, a piece that was apart from what they were doing all day in terms of software. But now you've taken the software, integrated it with telephony and made it so much easier for them to work. And I think that's, that's why people would still keep the PBX. I'd be curious what your thoughts are in terms of how the last four months have changed or maybe accelerated what we've all been talking about for the last few years relative to how people work. The two sides I'm looking at it from are one sort of IT spending. What are people willing to spend money on? So 
uh, you know, uh, for the 2010s, you know, every time you heard a security breach, like what was a big one, Equifax a couple years ago, you know, overall that moved the dial on security spending in IT because everyone's like, we can't get caught with this. And, and I think, uh, and you know, those big events had big repercussions in spending. And I think most companies can't get caught without a solution, a portable solution, a remote worker plan, all those things. So they're going to spend a lot more money on things that we do sort of communications and remote working. Um, you see, uh, uh, on the other side, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's really brought the, the bar down on, on, on user adoption, meaning, you know, it's not just the early adopters and the people who are sort of tech geeks. It's pretty much everyone using this, which means that usable products will win. So, you know, if you create something that, you know, I mean, if people have to think about it too much. We're all smart guys who know our craft well, but I'm sure there's, you know, when I make bread, it's really confusing, <laughs> you know, to me, all the, all the things I have to do, but when I, you know, and that's, that's something I'm not good at and I want it made simple. And, and I mean, phones, phones are, um, you know, are important, but we don't have time if we're in accounting to become a phone engineer. So usability is really important. So I think a lot of, a lot of, you know, I watch Microsoft really closely. A lot of the features they're coming out with are things that make it more pleasant as an experience, uh, make it more usable, you know, make it fewer button clicks and zoom was ready. I mean, zoom had that. That's why zoom, that's why we, that's why I'm wearing my zoom shirt. My, 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 my grandma knows how to use zoom now. And we've known that for a while, um, that usability wins, but it really wins when now people are spending money on it and they need solutions that are easy to use. So I read an article here last couple months that talked about you know, what it enables you to do as a business to be able to hire people remote. You, you ran a completely virtual remote uh, business of VoIP Logic. So for those companies out there that are having a really hard time getting their head wrapped around doing video interviews to make a decision on somebody and do I renew this lease and, you know, extend for another five years, <laughs> um, what advice you give to CEOs out there or hiring managers uh, based on your own personal experience? The companies that have that grew 15 years ago remotely, like like we were 15, 20 years ago, tended to do it uh, because of necessity. You know, they did it because, hey, AJ, I only have this much money to hire these people, and you know, and I don't have room, I don't have money for an office, and and so that that was me back then. It was uh, it was it just we were bootstrapping for a couple of years before we were venture funded, and uh, and and that was actually um, one of the issues. I mean, so so. I think the most impressive thing isn't that, you know, I've started a company that's great and, and all that, but it's that I got Broadworks, Broadsoft, I mean, Broadsoft to buy it being a completely remote company because it's really hard to sell. So an exit, I mean, a lot of funders will say you need an office, you need a place to call home. You know, that's, you need a team. It's all about the team. You don't know these people that well, you know, and, and those are, those are, first, I think that's changed a bit. I don't think that's changed dramatically. I think a lot of venture capitalists and a lot of funders want a company to have a place. I think, you know, we were one of the early ones that sold without an office. Oh, fun fact about Micah is that he lived internationally while he was running. Well, a company. That's true. So you were one of those guys that took that risk of saying, I can run a company virtually. That was so far ahead of its time. So my wife's I a professor. She's a, a modern European historian. And so whenever she gets a sabbatical year, we live in France and, yeah, uh, yeah. and the hard, it, the business part is transfer a business in a remote team is seamless. Trying to move a kid to a school in another country, a little bit harder, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. And, and I hope, I hope the, you know, um, what's his name? M Mullenweg. Is it Matthew Mullenweg speaks a lot about this um, and he's great. And he's built a company that's like 1300 people remote. And, and I like, I like reading his blogs and, and, uh, and respect what he's done immensely. I think, yeah, I mean, this is it. If more people like believe, see this technology as good, you know, all these things, it's going to be great for, for people already, you know, like Boise, Idaho is growing with Californians who are looking for cheap labor. It's going to get 
better. And, you know, and, and, and one thing, one thing I've noticed in already in the last three to five months is uh, lots of people in cities have been spending time outside of cities and buying homes outside of cities. And I mean, we're in a rural community where, where I live in Western Mass and, you know, the real estate market's never been hotter this summer because of this. So, so I think, or, you know, maybe this is particular pandemics, but I think people are moving to more remote places because it's safer and they can work there and do the same thing. Yeah. So well, you're, and, in, you're creating something that is going to allow them to be very effective from wherever they decide to settle down. And yeah, I know it's, it's, it's been really cool. I mean, service providers who are, you know, our customers, we, we sell through service providers. We haven't gone direct to enterprise yet because they're their customers and we're, we're really a feature on the PBX or, you know, on teams and, uh, and they just, yeah, the demand is, the interest is overwhelming. You know, I'm hearing that people want to try it. This is, you know, this, this is a, this is a cutting a cord that that's holding them back. So you're building things now that are APIs pulled together because everything is an API when you get to think about it. Has to be. Has yeah. to be. And so yeah, yeah. Now, now you just get really creative. You find these developers that say, hey, I can put chocolate and peanut butter together and that's really good. And I think that's what you've done with your entire, well, if you go back and look at your past from the very oh. beginning of VOIP, you were one of those guys that kept thinking about integrations and didn't just wait for Broadsoft to come up with the new revision, but instead you were tying things together from the very beginning. And uh, so congratulations for that, because look what you've done now in <laughs> yeah, relation fun. to what's happening with Microsoft. Technology is cool, but one thing that this remote worker, you know, COVID and so has accelerated. And for me, I've always seen this and thought it was viable, but um, you know, you, hiring people remotely, having people work remotely often means opening up your world of who you can hire. So, you know, the, the, the days of we have our developer shop in, you know, pick your Eastern European company and you have an office with 20 people, you know, it's going to become like one person in 20 places, you know, or, you know, 20 people, you know, 20 people in 20 places, sorry. And, um, and, and we've seen that, I mean, services like Upwork, um, you know, a successor to what Elance about 10 years ago, um, which I think is still around. Um, you can find people with the right skills, you know, price, you know, reasonable for their market, wherever they happen to be, and they can be members of your team and you can, you know, trust is an issue, but you know, you, you can try, you know, you can build trust. So not only can you have great technology, but great people with great skills to add in. Well, Micah, it has been uh, great having you on. As, uh, as David, I expected, uh, we knew it would be a great conversation, and we certainly appreciate the time. It's been great catching up with you. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you both so much. Uh, it's really interesting chatting about these topics, and uh, it's fun watching the market unfold. It really is. Yeah.